בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה. First of all, I want to thank uh, Shalom for, uh, for hosting us. Right now that we're in the middle of the move, and uh, also, either way, it's also nice to be in a different location, get uh, uh, different, uh, different uh, perspective. And, uh, you know, I think the uh, Shiut Torah, to bring a Shiut Torah to your house is uh, by far one of the most uh, amazing things you can do because it brings blessing to the house. You know, this is a very good suggestion anytime you move to a new house, uh, anytime that there is any types of issues going on in the house, chas uh, v'shalom, if there is a, uh, any type of illnesses or if there is uh, any type of uh, difficulties that people are going through, one of the best things you can do is bring Shuhet Torah to your house. Because the, uh, the house, you know, has to be blessed. Uh-huh. So bringing so much blessing into the house, bring Shuhet Torah every single second that we spend here, learn Torah, is a benefit and brings Baha to the house. So the, Baruch uh, Hashem, we had Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon, you know, give us private messages, uh, each, for each person that took something on themselves, uh, for, uh, you know, for the Chag, for, for the Judgment Day of Rosh Hashanah. And again, I think it's very, very important that uh, everyone take advantage of the opportunity by uh, trying to get 10 other people, 10 other Jews, to take something on themselves. Uh, there's no such thing as too big or too small. If someone wants to do something small, like doing a blessing before they eat, or they want to do something big, like doing tefillin or keep Shabbat, doesn't matter. Anything that they're not doing right now, they take on themselves for the benefit of this holiday. But Rabbi Shem will get them also a uh, special blessing. And uh, right now with uh, Judgment Day coming up in only a week from now, it's, uh, it's critical for us to get as many blessings as possible. So at least we show up to the trial with uh, prepared. Prepared for, uh, for what's, what's really going on. Uh, so this, uh, this parasha... Usually, this parasha, parashat Nitzavim, is usually read together with uh, parashat Vayelech. But uh, this year, uh, I guess because of how the, uh, the holiday is set up, uh, the parasha is actually read independently, read by itself. It's a very short parasha. Nitzavim. Okay, Nitzavim. Parashat Nitzavim. It's a very, very short parasha. Uh, I think it's the shortest, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so it's the shortest one uh, in the Torah, but it's every single word, every single sentence is a life changer. Like anything in the Torah, of course, but this specific one answers a lot of questions that people have in our generation specifically. A lot of questions, a lot of things that, uh, uh, that we deal with, people that are not keeping... Uh, Torah and mitzvot, people that are keeping, but they're not keeping out of love. I uh, spoke to someone today, uh, and uh, this woman, I spoke to her, and she, uh, she tells me, yeah, you know, I'm uh, keeping Shabbat, I keep kosher, but um, not because I really want to. I keep Shabbat because it's a separation for me for the rest of the week. And kosher, I think, because it's, it's good, it's healthier. So even though someone that keeps the mitzvot gets a benefit, of course, when you compare the mitzvah when you do it because you're just doing it versus when you do it out of love, the reward is worlds of difference apart. One is getting, let's say, from a level of one to ten is getting one. When they're just doing it because they have to, like it's an obligation, just like you will have to drink because you're thirsty, or you have to go to the bathroom because your body is moving a certain way, or you have to uh, wake up at some point because you can't sleep anymore. So it's almost become an instinct. That's one level. Doing it out of love, if it's from 1 to 10, it's a 100 reward. So one of the things that actually in the the parasha, last week it mentioned it, and before also, one of the things that actually makes Hashem very upset is when we don't do the mitzvot be'ava, with love. And that's some of the things we're going to learn today about the value of the mitzvot as far as importance. And most importantly, Hashem's opinion. 
Hashem's opinion about mitzvot. Hashem's opinion about the difficulty of the Torah. Hashem's opinion about what is the risk, what is the reward. And this parasha starts with a lot, has a lot of amazing information in it, and Bezat Hashem uh, will uh, will cover all of it. Uh, and uh, also, I want to make sure that if you have questions, either during the shiul or, or uh, towards the end, please ask the questions. You know, ask during the shiur, ask after the shiur. The key is to ask the questions, and I want to even capture it on video, because every week we have the shiur, we talk for two hours. I ask you guys if you have questions. Everyone says no, I don't know why. Two seconds after I turn off the camera, we have a very, very interesting conversation for two more hours. <laughs> it's even better than the shiur. So ask the questions, and, and we could, so we could all learn together, and Be'ezat Hashem also, because of your question, Lezakot Arabim, you know, to, to benefit the public, because other people also have those questions. I have a question. Have okay, Havod. Well, if it's a question or comment, what you said is that some people do, they keep Shabbat, or this lady in particular, if it's a shoe story or not, she keeps Shabbat, or she keeps kosher, because one is she keeps kosher because it's healthy for her, and she keeps Shabbat because it's separation from the rest of the week. Some people do tshuva because they're forced to do tshuva. Something happened, they need to do tshuva. Some people do tshuva because they feel that that's what they want to do. They do it, like you said, from there with their heart. Okay. The reality, though, is that, that you're still doing tshuva, no matter how you did it. But the person that did tshuva, that did it because they have to do it, they're forced into it. In a way, after what do you mean forced into it? What, somebody put a gun at their head and said, keep Shabbat? So, uh, in, in a certain situation, a parent passes away, you have to say, uh, you have to say Kaddish, you have to so you respect your parents and you, you want to... Issue. You have that obligation, so you start keeping Shabbat. You say, at least I'm going to keep Shabbat, so I can keep saying Kaddish, and it's going to be a mm-hmm. kosher Kaddish. So you keep Shabbat. After a while, you learn to love it, though. So no matter yeah. what, after a while, no matter what, you, you start having a liking for what you do. So it's not like you go off forever and say, Ken, I'm forced into it. At some point, you have to get connected to it. There's a verse in it, though. The sages tell us that uh, someone that starts doing a mitzvah uh, without really a full meaning... Yeah. And uh, intention behind it starts that way, eventually ends with having the intention and the love of the mitzvah. You're 100% right. But that's not what I was saying. What I was saying is, someone that does a mitzvah just for the sake of doing it because it's convenient for them. So, for example, every day we wake up, everyone washes their hands and their face, right? You wash your hands, you wash your face, it's, it's a natural thing. Now, if you do a bracha, you get a mitzvah for that. Right. If you don't do a bracha, you don't get a mitzvah. Okay, so you figure, okay, I'm going to wash my face and I'm going to wash my hands every day. Might as well do a bracha, it takes me an extra five seconds. But if you just do it, just because it's just a quick process, it doesn't really mean much to you. The reward for that is, let's say, from one to ten, is one. You get a reward, you get a mitzvah. <coughs> just like you keep Shabbat, you get a mitzvah. But if you do it with intention and meaning and value and, 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 and mamash kavana, the reward is a hundred. It's a two, it's the world of difference between the reward. It's so, right. so it's not that the person that's doing tshuva or that's keeping mitzvot is not getting a reward. Of course they're getting a reward. Nachuz. <coughs> they're getting a reward. Someone keeps mitzvah is not only uh, getting a reward, they're also securing their place that have the possibility of going to Allah Abba because someone that doesn't keep Shabbat does not have Allah Abba. So, of course, now that they're doing that, they, they give themselves an opportunity to go into Allah Abba. It doesn't guarantee them because there's other things that they may or may not be doing that could, uh, could conflict with it. But nonetheless, they have a very, very big opportunity. They have a giant mitzvah. It's the core of Judaism. It starts with Shabbat. But someone that keeps Shabbat, and let's say, for example, he's sleeping all day. Because, you know what, he's not used to Shabbat. He maybe he doesn't have a local synagogue, or maybe he doesn't feel like going to the synagogue, or maybe he's not connected to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, whatever the reason is, he just starts off his tshuva by keeping Shabbat, but sleeping all day. Great idea. Do it. 100%. If someone came to me, or uh, they actually have come to me, and uh, asked me about what to do with keep Shabbat, I don't want to go to the synagogue, but I also don't want to uh, be in a, you know, in a big mess with Hashem. I said, okay, go, keep Shabbat, sleep all day. I said, oh, really, I can do that? Yeah, sleep all day. Right now, at this level of where you are right now, it's the best idea. Go sleep all day. Now, if that person stays that way his whole life, 
The reward <coughs> is one. If the person over time continues to progress, continues to move forward, and now instead of just going to sleep all day, he makes a kiddush. Some more time passes, he not only makes a kiddush, he invites some friends. It's not by himself. A little bit more time passes, maybe he's going to pray by himself. One of the tefillot. A little more time passes, two tefillot. Two prayers that he does by himself. He does shachrit and mincha. A little more time passes, he says, you know what, let me try the synagogue. So each time that he adds something, he's creating oneg of Shabbat. Enjoyment of Shabbat. That's the significance. That's what brings them from a level 1 to a level 100. So when you enjoy Shabbat at its at full potential, there's nobody better than you in the world. I think at some point you get to that level, I'm sure. Just like you said, I mean, I guess would you give that person the advice of sleeping all day Mm -hmm. If you knew that, it, that at some point he wouldn't elevate himself to a higher level? I, I'm not a prophet yet. We haven't studied that yet, so I don't know what the future holds. But still. But what I can tell someone, anyone that's not keeping Shabbat, if the only way they're going to keep Shabbat is by sleeping all day, it's the best idea in the world. Go sleep all day, enjoy your sleep. Hashem will be very happy with you. Why? Because to be awake for even one second and be a Mechalel Shabbat, putting you in a very bad situation. So sleep all day, enjoy the sleep, dream, a million dreams. Yeah. Same exact thing as someone that says, you know what, listen, the only way I could keep Shabbat is if I stay home, I don't go anywhere. Or I could do what I've been doing for 20 years and I could keep Shabbat, but half. What do you mean half? I drive to shul. That's it, I don't drive anywhere else. I don't drive to the mall, I don't drive to the store. I just drive to shul, it's... 20 minutes from my house. From the beach, nothing. Not to the beach even. I'm not playing matkot. I'm just going straight to shul and come back. Matkot. <laughs> matkot. I was matkot. hoping someone, somebody's going to get it. <laughs> so that person, the only advice anyone in the world is allowed to give him and should give him is stay at home, never in your life go to synagogue. On Shabbat with the car. You're not allowed to violate Shabbat for any reason aside from saving a life. That's it. And even if someone, for example, Chas Shalom, is in danger, there's a life danger, someone uh, is a, uh, in jeopardy of uh, losing their life, even if, let's say, for example, you're not even 100% sure, let's say it's a child. Lo alenu, lo alechem, a child is, uh, has high fever. You're not sure if it's a life danger or life risk or not, but it's possible. Shabbat is put on hold. At that moment, you take him to the, to the uh, hospital. It's an emergency. And you bring him to the hospital. But life risk only puts Shabbat on hold. It doesn't cancel Shabbat. What does that mean? That means that as soon as the life risk is over, Shabbat is back on. Which means that as soon as you arrive at the hospital, right, life, the life risk is off. It's, it's off. You're already at the hospital. That means you cannot, you're not even allowed to turn off your car. Really? You're not even allowed to turn off your car because life risk is over. You, you arrived with the car. You brought the child into the hospital. You're not allowed to turn off the car. You could tell a guy, listen, I, uh, you know, I, uh, you could say, you could announce out loud, whoever, whoever shuts off the car will not lose. You can't even tell him to go shut off the car. You can't tell a guy specifically to go do something that you're not allowed to do. I don't know why some people do it, but they're not allowed to do it. Oh, the so point is some that... Some people will tell a guy to Some people go will tell a guy, listen, turn, turn on the light for me, or turn on... You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to tell a guy to do something specifically for you. But, but nonetheless, the point... Huh? So how do you go by it if you ask like, a guy to do it? How do you do it? You have to be creative. You have to, uh, for example... If let's say someone, uh, you know, ha their house is on fire. Let's say their house is on fire. But there's no one in the house, so there's no life risk. So you're not allowed to shut off the fire. You're not allowed to even call the fire department. So let's say, for example, you have a hundred million dollar house, like Bill Gates. House is a hundred million dollars. You're not allowed to call the fire department on Shabbat. 
It could be a billion dollars. Not allowed to call the fire department. Not allowed to violate Shabbat. Only time you're allowed to violate Shabbat is if somebody is inside and you have to get the fire department to save them. Pikuach Nefesh. Right. Now, what you can do is you can say anyone who puts out the fire will not lose out. You can't even tell them directly that what to do. You can't even say, listen, anyone that calls the fire department will not lose. You can say anyone that puts out the fire will not lose out. People are not stupid. They're going to realize, listen, a uh, guy has a $100 million house. So I'm going to call the fire department. Not even because he's going to give me money, but also because if his house goes on fire, it continue spreading and creating a problem. So this gives us an understanding of how important Shabbat is. Shabbat is never canceled for life. A lot of people think that life is more important than Shabbat. It's not. Shabbat is only put on hold for life. Once the life risk is over, Shabbat is back on. So Chazal explains to us in the Gemara, why is Shabbat put on hold for pikuach nefesh? Why is Shabbat put on hold for life risk? Because Chazak Baruch. He says so. He could violate one Shabbat, put, uh, you know, you, you're violating one Shabbat technically, because you're driving to the hospital. So, whoever you're saving can keep many Shabbatot. You understand? You're violating one Shabbat to save a life. Once you save that life, that life is going to keep Shabbat for the rest of his life. So it's better that we save his life one day and violate one Shabbat, so he's still alive and he can keep Shabbat for the rest of his life, another 20, 30, 50, 70 years. So this shows you that it's not that life is more important than Shabbat. It's that Shabbat is the key. So we're trying to get as many observations of Shabbat as possible. That's the goal. That's, the goal. That's why it's the fourth commandment. That's why it's higher than do not murder. That's why it's higher than respecting parents. That's why it's higher than everything else. Except Abu Dazara, which it's in essence equivalent to. So... When it comes down to the person that's not keeping that's keeping Shabbat but is not doing it out of love, it all depends on a case by case basis. So, for example, when someone that's just starting out, just starting out, they haven't kept Shabbat. For them, it's perfect advice to tell them, "Listen, you can sleep all day. Just stop violating Shabbat. Don't watch TV. Just stop violating Shabbat. Don't drive the car. Just do whatever you want. Just don't violate Shabbat. The mitzvot of Shabbat we'll talk about later." First, stop violating it. On the other hand, and then obviously over time, you give them advice to add more things and little by little enjoy Shabbat. Then they're going to do it on their own. Unfortunately, when you don't get the right teaching and you're just keeping Shabbat purely based out of fear or purely based on it's just a thing to do and you don't connect to the Shabbat, what ends up happening is that eventually you start not liking it. Eventually, you still look. You're still regretting the fact that you're keeping it. Why? Because you're keeping Shabbat, but you're thinking about all your friends are at the bar, all your friends are at the club, all your friends are at some hotel, all your friends are on vacation. On you the are beach playing matkot. on the beach playing matkot, <laughs> and you're like this misken staying at home. <laughs> this happened to me when I was a kid. Uh, I was in uh, college and uh, 17 years old, something like that. And I, was, I started keeping Shabbat, and uh, it was uh, very difficult because every Friday I see everybody's going out to the clubs, fraternity parties, doing this, and uh, me, I'm just staying in my room and sleeping. Okay, so you keep one Shabbat, two Shabbats, one month, six months, a year. After a while, you go crazy. So what does that mean? It means that in order for you to stay strong... It cannot only be out of fear. It has to be out of love. And that's what we talked about in last week's shiul. In order to stay religious, it can't only be out of fear. And it also can't be only out of love. Why? Love fades. Love, love by itself fades. At some point or another, okay, I love it, but I don't feel like doing it. Fear, at some point or another, you start thinking to yourself, I'm, I'm living my whole life just scared. I'm scared all the time. I can't take it anymore. You end up breaking. So it has to be a combination of both. It has to be some ira Love and some fear. ava. Some fear of Hashem and some love of Hashem. The combination of the two 
will get you to be religious and even stronger. So if you're going to keep Shabbat, well, how do you do that? How do you develop fear and love? You have to learn. What is, it, what is Shabbat, Bichlat? Why do we keep Shabbat? Why is it the fourth commandment? Why is it more important than life? Why does Hashem even care about the Shabbat? A little small idea to explain the significance of Shabbat and why it's such a dear punishment. It's just something that you can, makes you think a little bit. Hashem Barach created the world. In the Torah, it wrote, it wrote that during the first six days, He created. On the seventh day, He stopped creating. A lot of people think it says it re- He rested like He went to sleep, but Hashem doesn't sleep, He doesn't rest. He just stopped creating. That's what it means. But then when you think about it, if Hashem is really Hashem like it's written in the Torah, He didn't need six days to create the world. He didn't even need an instant. One second is too much already. He's Hashem. He's powerful. He's perfect. He's everything. So in reality, it didn't take six days because he needed six days. He didn't need six days. In reality, he created everything in an instant. Just he made it into six days, where over the next six days, he took, after he created everything in an instant, he took the piece from here, the, 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 uh, the big lights, the, the moon and the uh, uh, stars oh, and the sun, and he put them in its place. They, everything was already created and it was hanging in space. And he just took it and he put it in its place with all the stars, with all the galaxies, with all of the uh, planets, the water, he put in its place, everything he put in its place. So again, we go back to the same question. Okay, so he created it in an instant. Why did he bother to do it over six days? Why didn't he just do it in one day? He did it in six days in order to give us the Shabbat, the seventh day. What does it mean? He forced himself to extend his, the process by, in essence, minimizing himself. He can do it in one second, or less than a second. He forced himself to take more time to create a week. So we can have six days that are regular days for us, Yamechol, and then a seventh day that's different from every other day. Why? So on the seventh day, to give us his creations a feeling like he has. The same feeling he had on the seventh day where he stopped creating, he's giving you a human feeling, obviously it's not the same, but whatever we can, someone that really observes the Shabbat, will give you a feeling like you're not involved in all of these melachot, you're not involved in all of this creation, you're not involved in all of the work that you did over the first six days, you're not involved in any of that. On the seventh day, you stop. So he gives, he wants to give you as a holy Jew the feeling like Hashem Barach himself. So when you think about it, Hashem minimized himself, minimized himself for us. So when someone keeps the Shabbat, He's showing respect to Hashem. He's saying thank you for minimizing yourself and making a whole week for me, not for him. He doesn't need a week. Hashem doesn't have time. Hashem, the beginning, the middle, and the end is all the same to him. The beginning of the world, the middle of the world, and the end of the world are all the same time for him. The minute he created the world, it already ended for him. He already knows the future. So now, he did all of it for us. So by keeping Shabbat, the first thing we're doing is we're saying, yes, you did it. I know you did it. Second thing we're doing is saying thank you. Thank you, Hashem, for minimizing yourself for me. Every human being is supposed to say, Hashem created the world for me specifically. Every, every Jew is supposed to say, Hashem created the world for, for me specifically. Why? Because if you look at the world around you, you only see from your own point of view. Second, we'll finish the point. So now, last but not least, when you don't observe the Shabbat, then you're saying, number one, I don't believe you did it. I don't believe you created the, the world in a week, in six days. And number two, even if I believe it, I don't care that you minimize yourself for me. 
So he did all of this for you, and you're like, yeah. It's just like someone gives a, uh, a bride a special gift, and he wraps it in a beautiful big present. She goes, you know, in front of everybody there in the wedding hall. It's a big box. She unwraps it, and she sees it another box. And she unwraps it, and she sees another box. So you put a lot of work, a lot of thought into it. And she unwraps that one as another box. And she unwraps it as another box. She sees this, you know, it's fun. Everyone's enjoying it. Wow, he put so much thought into it. He wrapped one box after another box, after another box, after another box. Eventually, she gets to the bottom line box, a small little box, and she opens the box, and it's a beautiful diamond ring, something out of this world. And what does she say? Ich! And she throws it in his face. <laughs> Should he stay married to her? <coughs> no. Should he go on with the wedding? No. Not so much, right? It's not a good, bri not a good bride. No, not at all. This is exactly what happens with someone like us, not keeping Shabbat. Hashem created one wrapping after another wrapping, created a world, beautiful world. You can see there's colors, there's taste, there's smell, there's sounds. A whole week instead of one day. So much beautiful things in the world, so many miracles happening whether we notice them or not. And he put a one wrapper after another wrapper after another wrapper. And all we're doing when we're not keeping Shabbat is saying, eh, ich, we're throwing it in his face. Not so nice. And that's why when someone keeps Shabbat, after the first time, second time, yes, you can't go to compl complain to them. But if they're keeping Shabbat for a few years but they're still saying ich, it's a problem. That means they haven't learned what the significance of Shabbat is. Well, how about that? No, I just want to say, today, it's funny you talk about it, because today it's the day the world creates. Today, Hafei, Hafei and Hafei Be'elul, it's the world, uh, it's the day the world creates. Let's start to create the world. So, now, when we know that this, Chazak uh, uh, we know that there's a big difference between doing a mitzvah from love and doing a mitzvah just because of culture. We have to understand that the reward is a world apart. So if you're already going to do it, put some meaning into it. That's what I used to always tell in business, my employees. You're already coming to work. It's not like you're going to the movies instead. It's not like you're going to the beach playing matkot. <laughs> you know, you're already coming to work. You're already here for 8, 10, 12, 15 hours. I don't know how much, whatever you work. So if you're already here, put your effort in. Put 100% into it. It's not like, you know, if you do 50%, it takes less time. If anything, it takes more time. If you're already at work, put 100% into it. If you're already keeping a mitzvah, put 100% into it. And that's what we talked about last week. None of us is perfect. None of us are perfect. But whatever you're doing right now, put 100% into it. If you're doing Netilat Yadayim, put Netilat Yadayim with full kavanah. Mm -hmm. Don't talk to your wife while you're doing Netilat Yadayim. If you're doing the bracha for Asher Yatzar after you leave the bathroom, think about the miracles of how your body operates, of how you're actually able to go to the bathroom. If you're keeping Shabbat, keep Shabbat. Don't keep Shabbat and talk about business. Oh, yeah, you know what? I have this customer, and this customer did this to me, and this to me. Shabbat. Hashem minimized himself for you. What are you doing? You're already keeping it. You're already keeping it. Put 100% into it. So that's one thing that we can do. And that by itself, by the way, as far as the idea of taking something onto ourself, yesterday we had a very good idea, which is to spend a moment during the day to thank Hashem without asking for anything. Today is another idea. Whatever you do, take something on yourself where you say, instead of adding another mitzvah, because maybe you're doing too, as, enough, you can't handle any more mitzvot. Let's say you're packed. Right now, you can't do any more mitzvot. Fine. Take something on yourself where every mitzvah you're going to do, you're going to have 100% kavanah to the full potential. Whatever bracha you're going to do, if you're going to do bracha for shakon yamidvaro, or mezonot, or anything, you say it slowly. Baruch atah Hashem. Break it up into three like we talked about. Baruch atah Hashem. Eloheinu melech haolam. And the last part. Shakon yamidvaro. Boreh minem ezonot. And so on. 
Break it up into three. Say it out loud. Don't mumble it and run into it. If you're doing tefillin, think about the tefillin. Don't think about, oh, do you think his suit is Armani or it's uh, Hugo Boss? Because you're looking at the guy across and he has a nice suit. Think about the tefillin. If you're doing a, uh, if you're eating uh, food, you're doing Birkat Amazon, think about how amazing it is that Hashem created the heaven and the earth and He still cares enough about you to enjoy your meal. And that's why He gave you taste. That's why He gave you taste buds. Some people don't have taste buds. Some people, Allah, they know there's a, you know, they have a disease. They can't taste food. Wow. Imagine that everything was like for you, just like the snake. Sand. 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 Everything was the sand. Everything tasted the same. Imagine what a miserable life you would have. No colors. Imagine people that are colorblind. They can't see. Everything is black and white. Wow. Imagine that Hashem created the world with all these beautiful colors. You see in the house. You see outside. Everything is beautiful. Everything has colors. For what? For him? For you. So, you do a bracha, put kavana into it. That by itself could be bigger than taking on another mitzvah. Because sometimes if you're going to do another mitzvah, but also doesn't have kavanah, then you just added another one. You have, let's say you're doing 10 mitzvot. Each one, you're level one. Mm-hmm. You're level one. You're like, you're doing it. Okay, so I'm keeping this, I'm keeping this, I'm keeping this, but not much kavanah. So you have 10 level ones. Okay, so I'm going to take another one. I'm going to do, I don't know, netilat yadayim. So now I have 11. I went from 10 to 11. But if you stay at 10... But you say, now, from now on, I'm going to do it with 100% kavanah. You're at 10, but the 10 now has become 1,000. Because now you have full kavanah on each mitzvah. And that can get you to connect even deeper to Hashem. Mm -hmm. It's not just about doing more. People always recommend to do more because the assumption is that everything that you're doing already has kavanah in it. The reality of it is in our generation, it's not so much. If it was, they wouldn't put a poster in every wall, every corner of every Beknesset. Please, don't speak while the prayer is uh, going on. You know, Tefillah Glad Kavanah is like a goof without a neshama. A prayer without Kavanah is like a body without a soul. They have it in every Beknesset, they have it on the wall. If you go to Beknesset, next time you watch it, you'll see it in at least two corners of the, of the uh, Beknesset. In this one, and every other one, every Beknesset has it. Why? Because, you know, Tzarenu... Unfortunately, um, we're having problems with kavanah. So you don't have to add another thing. Stay the same, but put kavanah into it. So now we're going into this parasha. Parashat Mitzavim is a very short parasha, but it has a lot of answers to a lot of very, very deep questions. Atem Mitzavim ayom kulchem lifnei Adonai loechem rashechem, shiftechem, zignechem, veshotrechem, kol ish Yisrael. You are standing today, all of you, before Hashem, your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your small children, your women, and your proselyte who is in the midst of your camp, from the, from the hewer of your wood to the drawer of your water, for you to pass into, a cov- into the covenant of Hashem, your God, and into His imprecation that Hashem, your God, seals with you today in order to establish you today as a people to Him, and that He be a God to you, as He bespoke to you, and as He swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This is obviously much more than the Hebrew I read. Not with you alone do I seal this covenant and this imprecation, but with whoever is here, standing with us today before Hashem our God, and with whoever is not with, uh, here with us today. So we're going to focus on the last part. First of all, the first part, it says, Hashem nitza, um, Atem nitzavim ayom. You're standing here. What, what, what does it mean? This day? Of course, we know we're standing here. We know we're standing here. So why does he mention you're standing here today? The first verse, like every, every parasha, has a lot of meanings, a lot of translations or interpretations of the different things that, not conflicting with each other, but can add to it. But one of the things that uh, we learned from this first one so right now, Hashem is, uh, Moshe is telling us Hashem's message. That you're standing here today. Hashem has chosen you to be a people. And today, officially, you're becoming a nation. Again, the covenant is being renewed. It's the same covenant, but there's a few, there's one additional thing to it. 
But in, all, in essence, you are now re-accepting the Torah. When you are living the life of Torah, you have to stand strong. That's what the Nitzavim means. You're standing here today, not because they're physically standing. He's telling you, right now I'm talking to you and all future generations. Le'olam. When you live the life of Torah, you have to stand strong, stand firm. What does it mean? When you start doing tshuva, some people around you are not going to be the big fans of, of your tshuva. They're going to tell you, why, you or you went crazy? What are you doing tshuva for? What? You're going to become black and white? Or did you lose it? Who died? You know, if they first see somebody with a key, they say, who died? What happened? Why are you, why are you keeping Shabbat? Why you have nothing else to do with your life? Why you have problems with the business? Your wife doesn't like you anymore? What happened? Everyone thinks there's something wrong with it. I had one guy that I uh, talked to, I ran into, and uh, he says, you know, we started catching up a few things I haven't seen him in a long time. And uh, I say, oh, so where do you live? And he says, I live in a certain community. And, uh, but I send my children to school in a religious community. So, oh, okay, great. So that's great. He goes, yeah, but you know, we don't really do it at home. I just want the kids to have something. You know, I keep my distance. I keep my distance from the religious people. In his mind, the religious people have something that's good. Because that's obviously that's why he's sending his kids there. But for him, it's like a disease. This is the warped mentality that we live in today. People think there's something wrong with being religious. People think there's something wrong with having a permanent connection with the creator of the world. When you start doing tshuva, when you're doing mitzvot, you're going to have a lot of yetzara. Your Yetzara can come in all directions. We've talked about the Yetzara enough. How he comes, your friends, your family, your wife, your husband, your kids, your boss, your employees. Everyone can be your Yetzara. When you're doing tshuva and you're trying to get closer to Hashem, you have to stand firm. You have to be strong. Why? Because you're not doing it for fame. You're not doing it for... You're not doing it for fame and fortune. You're not doing it for a, uh, to get, uh, you know, become more popular with some people. You're doing it for your connection with God. So by saying, He says, you're standing today, all of you before Hashem, is to remember why you're doing tshuva. Because you're in front of Hashem at all times. Next thing it says. Velo itchem levatchem anochi koret et abrit. Azot ve et ala azot. Ki et asher yeshno po. Imanu omed ayom lifne Adonai Eloheinu. Ve et asher enenu po. Imanu ayom. He's saying. This covenant. This Torah that Hashem gave us, this renewal of the covenant, of the Brit, I'm not making this deal just with you, the people that are in front of me, the millions and millions of people that are in front of Moshe Rabbeinu. This covenant is forever. It's for the people here and the people that will be here in the future. So whoever says, sometimes they think, listen, Torah is nice, it has nice stories, it's interesting, it's not for me because, you know, Moses accepted it. I didn't accept it. He said he likes mitzvot. I didn't say anything. I wasn't there. No one told me. God didn't come to me and tell me that I have to keep mitzvot. Like he did to Moshe. Like he did to Am Yisrael over there. That's a mistake. Right here he's telling you, first of all, the breed is forever. It's for all of Am Yisrael. Second of all, every Jewish neshama was an Al Sinai. So this brings up the question of how is it that my neshama, that I know it's, it's here, I don't know what happened before, how is it that my neshama was there? There's something called Gilgulim, which is reincarnation in Judaism. This comes more from the mystical part of the Torah, 
In the Zohar, they give a lot of details about it. The uh, Aliyah Kadosh was uh, one of the main uh, people to make it more understandable for us because it was in such a high level that uh, that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wrote that you uh, you have to literally know the entire Torah to such a level that it's beyond what most people were able to ever achieve, even if they were Tamidim Chachamim. So, one small bit about Gigulim, one small bit about reincarnation is that when Hashem created the world, there was a single soul which was in the, the first human being, Adam Arishon. That soul broke up into all of the souls that are all of the, everyone, including the Goim and the Jews. Now, after the first sin, after the first sin of Cain and Abel, Abel died. But Abel died before he even made a sin. He was a perfect soul. But at the same time, he wasn't able to complete his mission. He wasn't able. The world didn't come to its purpose yet. The world didn't reach the Mashiach. It didn't reach its climax yet. So that means that Abel lived a very short life because Cain killed him because he was jealous that he had two wives versus one wife and that Hashem accepted his koban and not Esav, and not um, Cain's uh, koban. This also goes back to the uh, whole uh, issue of kavana. When Abel gave the koban to Hashem, he had full kavana. Full intention, he gave him his best stuff. The best of what he had, he gave to Hashem, whereas Cain gave him his worst. This is also one of the first source, the battle between Cain and Abel, of where we get Shatnez. The whole mitzvah of Shatnez comes from, originally comes from Cain and Abel. Later on, it's because that's the type of clothing that the Kohanim and Gedolim used to wear. But nonetheless, the first source of Shatnez is Cain and Abel because the sin of Cain was so big that Hashem said, I never want those two together again. So now, since Abel was not able to fulfill his mission, he had to come back. So he had a gigul. He came back as Moshe Rabbeinu. He was a perfect soul. Never made a sin. Moshe Rabbeinu was the biggest we ever had. Biggest we will ever have. Even the Mashiach, they say the Mashiach will not be as big as Moshe Rabbeinu. Will be smarter than Shlomo HaMelech, but not as big, not quite as big as Moshe Rabbeinu. Part of his soul will come from Moshe Rabbeinu, the Mashiach's soul. Part of his soul will come from Moshe Rabbeinu, part of his soul will come from David HaMelech. So now, we fast forward a little bit more. We go to the times of Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu, his father was, before he did tshuva, was an idol worshiper and he used to sell idols. He died after doing tshuva, but still had a lot of sins left behind him. So he came back as a Gilgul, as a reincarnation of Job. So now, all of these reincarnations, we have, there's different proofs of how they prove it through the verses. They say the same thing, different ways that they prove all of these things. But sometimes you see something very interesting with Gilgulim. Sometimes you see that the same person came back as two people. Cain, that killed Abel, came back as two people in the same generation. He came back as the Egyptian that Moshe killed in order to repent to do tshuva and pay back for killing Abel. He had to be killed. Who killed him? Who used to be Abel? The second, second Gigul, during the same generation, he came back as Yitro. Why Yitro? Because he killed Abel because of a woman. He wanted, his, he wanted his woman. So because he wanted his woman, that's why he killed him. He had to come back as Yitro because he had to give away a woman to repent for the sin. 
So one of the things, again, this is a small, this is sometimes a little confusing, sometimes not, but the point is, what I'm trying to explain here is that a soul is not like a soul like we think that this is just an individual soul by itself, it goes from one person to another. A soul is more like fire. It can be broken up into unlimited amount of pieces. And that's the confusing part for most people and they say, wait a minute. If, let's say, for example, there was... Uh, 15 million Jews. Oh no, forget, before that even. Let's say there was, uh, you know, Yaakov Avinu came down to Egypt with 70 people. That became Ami Sled. 70 people came to Egypt. How did 70 people turn into 15 million or so Jews we have today? Something's wrong with the system? So now, <coughs> each soul still from the original source, but each soul breaks up into multiple pieces. Soul is like fire. So for example, if you have one candle and you want to light a second candle, you take the, the candle that has fire on it, you take the candle that doesn't have fire on it, you put it, you light the second candle, this one is lit, and so is this one. The, 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 the one that lit the second one didn't change. You stay the same fire. But just now you have two fires. Same thing with the soul. Ariya Kadosh said the, uh, that someone that is trying to understand the concept of souls, the concept of Gilgulim, has to understand that in every Gilgul, it's not that the entire soul comes back. So, for example, if someone lived a life and he kept some of the mitzvot, he kept Shabbat, he kept Filin, he kept this, he kept that, but there's a few things that he didn't do that were good. Let's say he kept... 75%. 75%. Now, if the same soul came back again, there's a possibility that that 75% that used to be at Sadiq can make a uh, sin. So what does Hashem do? He takes the 75% that's, that's righteous, that already fixed itself, and that stays up there. It doesn't come back down. Only the 25% that's not fixed. So the Arizal says that a soul is like drops of water. You have to think about it like drops of water. So you say, like, for example, if you have a, uh, this uh, bottle of water, but if you break up this, let's say this is a soul, but if you break up this bottle into drops of water, there's a lot of drops. It's drop one, one, you know, I don't know, maybe uh, you know, a few thousand drops or a few hundred thousand drops in here. That's your soul. <clears throat> so the part that's fixed is already up there. The real part that's fixed, that's tzaddik, is already up there, meaning that what we're left with, usually, not all the time, but usually, is the part that's not so fixed. So each person that comes to this world has to fix something. How do you know what you have to fix? How do you know what's your specific tikkun? Everyone in this world has a specific individualistic tikkun that they have to overcome in their life. Aside from the basic foundation of mitzvot. Obviously everyone has to keep Shabbat, everyone has to keep kosher and so on. But you also in specifically have a, a tikkun that you have to overcome. One, two, a thousand, I don't know, each person in his own level. Mm -hmm. The way you know it is that what is the most difficult thing for you to do? That's your tikkun. If you have a difficulty being modest, a woman likes to dress sexy and show herself and so on, and for her, the concept of kisui osh is a nightmare. That's your tikkun. If your problem is that you love money so much, you like moving it, you like gambling it, you like this, you like that, that's your tikkun. Why? You don't like giving. When you love money too much, you don't want to give it. Why would you give something you love? If your uh, issue is that you don't want to be settled down with one relationship. You want to date. You want to go with this woman and that woman and this one. You want to be John Travolta. That's your tikkun. Whatever it is, everyone has their own tikkun. And until you finish your tikkun, you're going to keep, keep coming back. There's only one, one problem. When Hashem created the world, He also created the world with a certain time frame. There's a limit. How long the world is going to exist? 
We're at that limit now. We're in the days that are called the end of days. Right now, as we are all the sages from back then and the sages of today, all know, all agree, all have announced, we are in the end of days. We've already been in the end of days for, I think, a couple of decades already. Which means that we cannot rely on the concept of a gigul. Complete your life. You don't know if you're going to come back or not. Also, one thing to know is that a gilgul is not exactly a reward. It is a show of mercy from Hashem, but it's not a reward. When the neshama is asked in Shemaim if it wants to come back, it always answers no. It says that it prefers to go and suffer in Gehenom than come back to this world. We haven't talked about Gehenom in a while. We're not going to talk about it too much. We're not going to talk about it today. But any of the ideas, yeah, Shimo's not here, so we can talk a little more. <laughs> so, to give you a concept, the story in the, in the Gemara, after, if you guys remember the story I told you about Titus, the evil uh, Roman uh, Caesar, that. Uh, destroyed the Beit HaMikdash and uh, made a lot of sins in it and so on. Now, after he died, his nephew came into power. But his nephew saw that the Jewish people were something very different than the Roman people or the rest of the people. And he had some questions. He wanted to know, is this Torah that these Jewish people are fighting for, is this real? So he did a seance. And he brought back his famous uncle, Titus, in Hebrew, it's Titus. And he brought him back, which, by the way, you're not allowed to do a seance in Judaism, but he did it. He's not, he wasn't Jewish. And he asked them, who is important in the uh, after death? Who is important in the next world? And Titus answers, the Jewish people are the most important. And he says, so is it worth it for me to convert and become a Jew? And he says, uh, no, you're not going to be able to keep all of their mitzvot. You aren't brought up that way. It's going to be too hard for you. Stay a Roman Caesar. At least you'll benefit in this world and torture them, torture the Jews as much as possible. Because Hashem punishes the Jews whenever they sin. So right now is the time for them to be punished because they made a lot of sins, so he's going to give you power, so at least you benefit in one world. So he asks Titus, what's your punishment in the next world? You are an evil person, obviously. If the Jews are the most important, you did something against them, obviously, and they're God. What's your punishment? And he says in Gehenom, every day they take me, they burn me up into ashes, and they spread me amongst the ocean, and then they bring me back up. Then they put me back together, and then they burn me again. And they spread me around, and they burn me again, over and over and over again, never ends. That's his hell. That's his Gehenom. So, next question is, I, I got to bring another opinion. He says they're the best, but at the same time he's saying don't do it. It doesn't make that much sense. So I'm going to bring another famous leader. I'm going to bring Bilam. Bilam was the prophet of the Goim. The biggest prophet that the Goim have ever had. But he was also a Rasha. He went against Israel. Made a lot of a sin. 24,000 Jews died because of him. So he says to Bilam, who is important in the next world? He says the Jews are the most important. And he says to him... Should I convert? He says, no. It's too much for you. You weren't brought up this way. It's too hard. Shabbat, filin, nida, modesty. Not for you. Torture them in the world. At least you're going to benefit in one world. He says to him, okay, you are a rasha in this world. It went against the Torah and against their, their God. What's your punishment? And he says... Because I sinned every day, I slept, my, my wife was my donkey. 
His wife was the donkey. This is actually written a verse in the Torah. Remember a few months ago we went over it? His wife was his donkey. He used to talk to the donkey. The donkey spoke back. This is written in the Torah. This is not like a Midrash. This is written in the Torah. Because I made a big sin, even for the Goyim, you're not allowed to do it. It's one of it's, it's a violation of the seven uh, Noahide laws. Because I sinned, every day I get boiled in a pool, but not a pool like a nice pool, a pool of seed, seed, sperm. I get burned every day, boiled in this, in this disgustingness. Because of all the sperm, all the seed that I wasted, making a sin. So who's the next one he called? Anyone have a guess? JC. JC. He called JC, and JC was a Jew. So he asked him, who's the who's the leaders? JC says the Jews are the leader. He says, should I convert? Because yes, you should convert because they're the chosen people. And despite whatever sins I made, despite whatever difficulty you endure, it's worth it. The sages teach us from this shows that a wicked Jew which Jesus was, is still better than any wicked going. Because he, at least after he died, he still told us the truth of what we need to do. Or he told this person, which we'll go to his name in a second. So he said, okay, you are Rasha also. <laughs> no one made the Jews suffer more than JC. As a result of him, not him directly, but indirectly because of what he did. What's your punishment? He said, every day I'm boiled in a pool of excrement, the other stuff, the other side. Poop, if you didn't get it. <laughs> Every day I'm boiled in this boiling, and that's what I, he goes, why? I understand why Titus got his punishment. He burned the Bet HaMikdash. He gets burned every day. I understand Bilam is getting, he wasted seed. Wasting seed is a big, big, big sin. Murdering people, especially in the donkey, so is punishment. I understand, but what about you? How come? How come you're in in uh, in that? Which, by the way, that's the seventh level again. No, that's the worst one. Why? Because because I went against the rabbis, and going against the rabbis, the sages of Hashem, is the worst thing you can do. We're not talking about just any rabbi. If the rabbi is a rasha and he's going against the Torah himself, then he's not considered a rabbi. Obviously, we're talking about righteous people. The reason I even mentioned that disclosure is because, unfortunately, in today's age, there's a lot of headlines with bad news of people that pretend to be rabbis, but they're really psychopaths. So, we're talking about righteous people. So, this gives us a little bit of an understanding. This is from the Gemara. This gives us a little bit of an understanding of... The souls are saying, I'd rather go to that place than come back to this world. Why? Because the test is difficult in this world. Maybe I'm going to become a bigger sinner. Maybe I'm going to make more sins. Maybe I'll be worse. I'm scared. I don't want to go. And Hashem says, you have to go and you come and you fix yourself. Bezat Hashem, you, and you come back and you don't have to deal with all of that suffering. But the point is that we have to fix ourselves. We have to fix ourselves. You can't live your life thinking that you're the same thing as Bilam's donkey and you're here today, you're gone tomorrow. You can't be here and think, oh no, I could do whatever I want and maybe one day I'll do tshuva once I have enough money, once I have a wife, once I have this, once I have that. It's a bad situation. Why? Because someone says, I'm going to sin today and eventually I'm going to do tshuva. One of the big punishments is that they won't let them do tshuva. So the key is that we have to do tshuva. Now I'm talking a little harder than, you know, than in recent past, especially the last couple of weeks, because if someone doesn't do tshuva before Yom Adin, or at least has an intention to do tshuva, I'm not saying become complete, I'm not saying become Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm not saying become Rabbi Akiva, I'm saying something, 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 take something. You don't do tefillin, do tefillin. You don't keep Shabbat, keep Shabbat. You don't uh, wash your hands, wash your hands. Something. 
Someone going to the trial coming up in a week from today, or less than a week from today, and he's going to show up with nothing and say, Hey, God, how are you? <laughs> I have nothing to show for it, but yeah, I came to the Knesset. I have a brand new suit. What's the judge going to think? So we, if we're not going to do some type of tshuva, when are we going to do it? And anyone that has a question of whether the laws of Moshe Rabbeinu are relevant, he says it right in this verse that this is for all generations, the ones that were there and the ones that weren't there. Meaning that anyone, for example, the next question would be, okay, what about converts? Converts weren't at uh, Mount Sinai. How come it's saying the ones with, you know, it's, uh, you said all of the Jews were in Mount Sinai. So there's two answers to that. Number one, whenever someone converts, they get a new soul. The new soul has nothing to do with the old soul. It's a completely brand new soul. It's a completely Jewish soul. It's a soul that was in Mount Sinai. The second thing is, is that that's also why it says the people that were here and people that were not here. So whatever, whichever way, whether you like, you know, some people don't like to believe in the mystical stuff. They like to believe in the plain, simple. Fine. There's still an answer for them too. The next uh, paragraph talks about warning again about idolatry. But not the type of idolatry that we always talk about. I mean, even though it mentions the gods of wood and the god of stone. Because obviously this is a prophecy telling us what's going to be the leading religions in the world at the end of times. Stone referring to Islam, which is nearly 30 or 40% of the world, if not more by now. And wood is Christianity and Catholicism, which is probably another 30 or so, 40% of the world. But it's not only talking about that. It says, But you it, Shikutsehem, Ved Gilulehem, Etzva Even, Kesef Ezaav, Asharimahem. It says, And you saw their abominations, it's referring to idol worship, and their detestable idols of wood and stone, which again referring to Christianity and Islam. It's uh, thundering, so we're getting some action. We're getting some response. And then after that it says, Of wood and stone, of silver and gold, that were with them. What do you mean silver of gold? What, what God is it silver of gold? And it's saying that not only is this silver and gold type of idol worship, but it's silver and gold is with them. It's already there. Mani, hazaku Mani, love of money. Love of money is another form of idol worship. If you love money too much, not only is that your tikkun, but it's something you have to work on immediately. Because it can turn into a form of idol worship. You could not only not keep mitzvot because of money, but you could become the biggest kofer in history because of money. It's very easy to fall for money. It's a very big test. We talked about it yesterday. It's a bigger test to have a lot of money than to not have any money. So money is a very, very difficult test that he's already writing in this parasha. He's telling you, this is something you have to be very careful of. It's a very big test. Another thing it's talking about is that people have, like this woman that I was talking about, and it is a true story, uh, uh, Tomil. They have their own philosophy. People create their own religion. Sometimes those people happen to be Jewish, and sometimes those people happen to be, you know, somewhat religious. They keep a few mitzvot, they keep Shabbat, maybe they keep kosher, maybe they keep, uh, you know, a few other things that are convenient to their life. But they don't accept the Torah as a whole. They accept things that they can relate to, things that are convenient for their life, things that fit within their life. And people develop these lifestyles. They live in a certain community. So they say, okay, let me fit into this community. Everybody goes to the synagogue. I'm going to go to the synagogue. Everyone wears black and white. I'm going to wear black and white. Everyone wears a wig. I'll wear a wig. They don't have any consideration to whether it's right or wrong to do any of those things. Whether Hashem wants you to do it or not wants you to do it. You're not doing it for Hashem. 
You're doing it to live this lifestyle. You're doing it to develop this philosophy. And some people say, listen, like the Greeks, they used to say, we believe that there's a creator, but he left. He doesn't uh, care whether I do a bracha if I eat. He doesn't care if I wrap this strange leather thing around my uh, arm or my head. He doesn't care if I do a special blessing when I leave the bathroom. That seems to me like it's crazy. You know, they, they... So people make up their own philosophies, their own religions. This is another one of the warnings that he's telling you, is that these philosophies are in essence idolatry, the idol worship. They're new religions, even if they're, they only have one believer. One thing we need to know is that the most famous philosopher of all time is Aristotle. He's in essence the father of philosophy, of, of that kind of thought, of you know, thinking independently. <coughs> Aristotle, everyone that studied philosophy, you know, they studied Nietzsche, they studied, uh, you know, they read the book The Prince, and uh, you, uh, you've read uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, different books. Here. There's Plato, there's Aristo, and there's plenty of other ones. I spent some time reading them when I was younger. Very smart people. No question about it. Much smarter than anyone we have in our generation by far. But at the same time, very stupid. Why stupid? Because they refused to believe that there was anything beyond them. Anything that was superior to them. Superior to the independent thought. So much so that they said, yes, there is a creator, but he's not in charge. We are. We're, you know, the man leads the world. And sometimes the biggest, not sometimes, all the time, the biggest mistakes in human history are made by the smartest people. So don't, you know, don't think that just because someone is smart, they don't make mistakes. That's the, that's the foolishness of today, that people think that just because someone is a professor or a doctor or a scientist or a Nobel Prize winner of some kind... Whatever he says is kadosh. Whatever he says is 100% fact and holy. It's complete nonsense. Whether he has doctor before or after his name, whether he has PhD in the middle, behind, forward, on top, on the side of his name, none of that means anything. He's still human, and most likely he makes as many, if not more, mistakes than the rest of us. There's no way to know what's right and wrong without, apply, without looking into the source, into the provider of the definition of right and wrong. But why do I mention Aristo? Why do I mention Aristotle? Because Aristotle, any intelligent human being today, especially the PhDs and doctors and Nobel Prize winners, you ask them, how do you compare yourself to Aristotle? And I'm counting, counting all the smartest people in the world. How do you compare yourself to Aristotle? Everyone will say, maybe, maybe, I could be his shoe. Maybe. I could be just his shoe. The rest of it, no, too much. Brain beyond me. Maybe I could be a shoe. Maybe I could be a slipper. Maybe I could be a glove. I'll never be Aristotle. His brain is something beyond us. The father of this independent thought, very intelligent person, he was also the teacher of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered the entire world. No leader after him was as strong as Alexander the Great. He was his teacher, I think, one-on-one uh, -on -one for 16 or 17 years. Interesting part about Aristotle is that towards the end of his life, he sent his student, his loyal student, and his very big advocate, Alexander the Great, a letter that became public. And that letter said that, I've discovered that everything that I taught you, and everything that I believe in, and everything that I've written, is complete nonsense. I'm obviously putting it in my own words, but he's also used some of these words. It's complete nonsense. I met a Jew that taught me something called the Torah. And his Torah is far beyond anything 
that we could ever think of. So much so that anyone that spends any time looking into this Torah will have endless reward. Whereas anyone that looks into my work that I had spent my whole life will have endless punishment. It's a complete waste of time. And if I could, I would burn every book that I have ever written. I, was gonna, I wanted to tell you this years ago, but I was scared for my life. I was scared that you're going to kill me. But now since I know I'm dying soon, I don't have that much time. I figured at least someone needs to know the truth. Because that's what I've been doing, studying the Torah to his, you know, for years already. To, towards the end. Towards the end. <clears throat> Problem is that most people that study his work don't study that letter. They skip over that part. So now, next part is... Hashem is tell, Moshe is telling us So he's saying, yeah, he knows the entire Torah by heart. It's amazing. It's amazing. The fact that he's sitting with us is a privilege. And it will be that when he hears the words, of his imprecation, this is his punishment in essence, his curse. He will bless himself in his heart saying, Peace will be with me, though I walk as my heart seats fit, thereby adding the water upon the thirsty. So first of all, he's talking about someone that's like what we talked about. It's making their own rules. I'm going to keep this, but not this. I'm going to do this, but not this. He says, this person is going to try to rationalize it to themselves. So they say, no, these uh, diseases, losses, problems, they're far away. They happen to other people. They don't happen to me. They don't happen to people like me. They happen to other people. I'm, I'm okay. I keep a few. You know, I keep kosher. No Shabbat, no tefillin, no nothing else, but I keep kosher when I'm home. <laughs> Meat. Not dairy. Yeah, they justify their own yeah, behavior. So he's talking specifically to this person. But then he adds something at the end. He says, He's saying, thereby adding water upon the thirsty. What does it mean, water upon the thirsty? If someone's thirsty, obviously they want water. But he's talking about when he's referring to watered, someone that's being given water, like Ego is being given water right now, <laughs> Ego may be given water right now, but he's not really thirsty. It's convenient. He's not dying of thirst. He's maybe it's, he's going to enjoy the water. He wants to say that. He wants to say that bracha. The thirsty, on the other hand, the thirsty is in. Uh, he knows that if he doesn't drink, it's only a matter of time before it gets to become a big problem. So this is a parable where Moshe Rabbeinu is telling us. When you have an opportunity to do tshuva, take advantage of it. When the sin that you're making is still not, you're not addicted to it. You're not addicted to the sin. You're not addicted to money. You're not addicted to women. You're not addicted to all of these big things. You're not addicted to these things. You're not addicted to gambling yet. You just started playing. You find out that it's a sin, stop at that point. Don't wait until the sin becomes part of your natural behavior where you're like a thirsty addict and for you to stop sinning, oh, you have to go to a very, very big problem, withdrawal. Don't become like the thirsty. When you have an opportunity to make tshuva, make it. Make it right away. The next thing he's talking about is that, you know, Hashem is telling us that there's going to be, you know, if, if we fi if violate the Torah, there's going to be some problems. And there's a prophecy here. He talks about what's going to happen to Eretz Yisrael if there's a sin. This has come true. This is one of this, despite the Torah being written over 3,300 years ago. Uh, this already came true. Oh, um, so it says, I'll just read it in English to save time. Uh, the later generation... 
will say, your children who will rise after you, and the foreigner who will come from a distant land, when they will see the plagues of that land, so he's saying that in essence the land of Israel will be cursed, and nothing will grow there, and he's comparing it, it will be like the upheaval of Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, Hashem overturned his anger and wrath, and all the nations will say, For what reason did Hashem do so to this land? Why this wrathful of great anger? So he's saying that after the you know people of Israel sin, he's gonna throw them out of the land, he's gonna punish the land also. And all the, it's not that they're, obviously the Jews know why it happened. But he says it's going to be so obvious that the non-Jews are going to realize it. In the late 1800s, I believe it's maybe 1875, 1878, something like that, maybe a little later, around that time, there's a very famous person by the name of Mark Twain. Mark Twain, we've said this in previous lectures in the past, Mark Twain came to the land of Israel. And he wrote something, he wrote an article about it. And he says, you know, we read our whole life that the land of Israel was the land of milk and honey. But even a cactus, even an olive tree is not growing here. It's a completely desolate land. Nothing grows here. Not even a tree, the types of trees that grow on rocks don't need any water. He says it's almost like God has cursed this land. Why is it being punished? Why is God so angry on this, about, on, on this land? Exactly what the verse that was written 3,300 years ago said. Mm -hmm. Obviously, after the righteous Jews came to the land of Israel, started buying land, uh, the original people were religious Jews, not the Zionists. They came to uh, Israel in the late 1800s, bought some land, turned the land into a very fertile place, and then the Zionists came later on and uh, infiltrated the land with their communism. But nonetheless, we at least got a country and it's a good place, just not the greatest government. So now, the next chapter, the next uh, part or section of this, uh, of this uh, parasha is something that applies to all of us. If we could pay attention to this last part, Bezat Hashem will finish soon, we're almost done. You with me, Igor? This parasha, this section of the parasha is parasha tshuva. This section specifically talks about tshuva. A lot of people always ask, where does it mention tshuva in the Torah? Where does it mention? Maybe if I sin, maybe if, listen, right now I keep Shabbat. Right now I keep this, I keep this, I keep this, I keep this. But the Torah has a lot of harsh words. Last few weeks we've been getting it on the head every week from Yaron. Every week, pa, pa, this curse, that curse, ahu, this, that. Okay, I understand, I understand. What does it say that if I stop making my sins, there's hope for me? This is the section. Anistaot la Adonai Eloheinu v'aniglot lanu ulevanenu. Ad olam la'asot et kol divrei ha-Torah azot. So first he's telling us the hidden sins are for Hashem, our God. But for the revealed sins are for us and our children forever to carry out all the words of this Torah. So this particular verse has a lot of uh, interpretations. One of them is that he's, the, the literal translation is that he's talking to the entire nation of Israel. Is that he's telling you, this is the time where you have to understand you being Jewish is not enough. You have to be part of the people. You have to be part of the nation. You can't be one of these Jews that's just doing tshuva on himself, by himself, just keeping mitzvot by himself. But the rest of your friends, the rest of your, your family, the rest of your neighborhood is full of people that are violating the Torah and you don't say anything to anyone. Not allowed. I will hold you responsible for not telling them, for not rebuking them. Obviously, there's a way to do it. But there's a mitzvah in the Torah. You have to rebuke the people. You have to reprove them. You have to tell people that, listen, you're not allowed to violate Shabbat. You're not allowed to eat this. You're not, you have to tell people in a certain way. Obviously, doing it, bringing them to a shiur is a form of rebuking. 
telling them privately, not in front of people, so make sure not to embarrass them. There's a way to do it. But nonetheless, the important part of Hashem is telling you, you can't just be a Jew on his own island and just care for yourself. You're one people, you're one nation, you have to worry about each other. If we don't worry about each other, there is no nation. There is no covenant. So don't think that you could just get away with just taking care of yourself. That's number one. You keep mitzvot, you have to start encouraging people. That's why the idea of getting ten people to write down something of what they're taking on themselves, that's a form of rebuking. It's a form of ochiyah tochiyah. You tell them, come on, do something, do something. You're, you're putting somebody on the spot. Take something on yourself. You don't do the tila tila, do the tila tila. You don't do bracha before you eat a cookie every day, do a bracha. Something, take something. So they're thinking, okay, you know what, I'm going to do something, I'll get a blessing, it makes me feel good, fine. He's not telling me that I should leave my uh, goyish girlfriend or my uh, Muslim boyfriend. Fine, but uh, I can do a bracha. This is the, you know, they don't feel like it's too much, but at least it's something. It gets them to reconnect. Right before Shana. He's telling you, you can't leave by yourself. But you can't you know, think that it's okay to do that. The second thing is, he's saying, even though I'm going to hold you responsible for your neighborhood, for your family, for everyone that you have access to, everyone in their own level, a rabbi, obviously for his community, a bigger rabbi for a city, but someone like a simple Jew, his family, a few friends, a child can't be responsible for his school, maybe himself, maybe one of his, his best friends, his close buddy. So every person in his own level. But they're responsible for somebody else. Not, no one is responsible just for themselves. But he says, but if someone, one of these people that's in your circle, that you're responsible for, they make a sin, but it's a hidden sin. Anistalot. Don't worry. I'm not holding you responsible for that. If they're making a sin and hiding, you're not responsible for that. Hashem will take care of that. You're responsible for the things they do in public. You see someone driving to Beknesset, you're responsible for that. You see someone eating non-kosher place, you're responsible for that. But there's a few people in our synagogue, they drive. So how do you... How do you approach them? Yeah. Everyone, it depends what kind of relationship you have with them. If you don't know them at all, then obviously the, the, the key is to try to either get to know them or find out if you know a common person. If you both know a common person, then try to get the other person to say something. Obviously, if they haven't said something by now, they're most likely not going to say something. So it's good to befriend this person. If you do know them, then bring up the conversation. If you're not comfortable with that, you're not knowledgeable enough about it yet, then bring them to a shield. Bring them to a shield Torah and someone else will do it. I will volunteer. <laughs> Uh, if uh, if they if you can't convince them to come to a shul, I'll give you a CD. Give them a CD. Try to see if you can get them to uh, watch it or listen to it. But with that part, you have to follow up. You can't just say here's a CD. The guy throws it in the back of his truck, and the CD is as good as garbage. Give the CD. Say, listen, it's really really good. You know, sell it. It's a really good. It's a really good alza. It's really good. Da, 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 da. Okay, okay, I'll listen to it. You know, everybody says okay, okay, sure, sure. Thank you, Nissan. But the next day or the next week, follow. Do you listen? No, no, no. Okay, come on, listen. I just, I just heard it again. Keep following up with them. Keep following up with them. So everyone has to be on their own level. If you can get them to come to Shiu, that's the best. Because then we can get them to do tshuva, not just for one avera, one, one sin, but for many sins. And then you know what we can say about the yeah, we uh, can, Shabbat drive. Yeah, we can talk about Shabbat. We can talk about everything. Scare them a little bit. Right. Tell them the truth. If the truth is scary, that means that we're not willing to change. The truth is never scary... If you're willing to change, that's what someone wrote. One of the comments that they made on the, uh, the video last week was a very strong video. You know, a very strong parasha. Talked about the parasha itself is already difficult. Then we saw the prophecies in the parasha that happened not only during the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, but also during the Shoah, during the Holocaust. We see it mentions the eagle. We see all the signs, all the literal. You could see it, not just using codes. The literal translation of the parasha, you can see everything that happened during the concentration camps happened in this last week's parasha. But then on top of it, we see that my personal story, before I did tshuva and all that stuff, see all the individual curses, most of them I had. So Hashem's not joking around. 
When it says, when someone says Amen, it means El Melech Neeman. It means Hashem, when he says something, he's going to do it. He's not saying it just because to entertain you with a parasha. He's going to do what he says. So one of the people that watched the, uh, watched the shiur was actually our most popular shiur. So Baruch Hashem was the strongest shiur and Baruch Hashem, it reached the most amount of people. A lot of good comments, a lot of people are uh, affected by it in a positive way. One person said it's a very, very strong shiur, but it's tough to hear. Tough words. So I think she said hard, hard, hard to hear, something like that. Yes. The response was, yes, it is, it's tough words. But difficulty is based on our interpretation of it. Meaning, everyone can have the same experience. Whatever the experience is. If I tell you guys, listen, we all have to start doing this mitzvah, it's called Shabbat, or it's called whatever else. Someone that's not willing already, before I told them what the mitzvah is, He's not willing to add anything to himself. When I said, listen, let's all take something on. And this guy's already saying, listen, me coming to the shul once a week is already a miracle. You want me to take a mitzvah also? Come on. So that person, for me, to tell him Shabbat, for him, it's like, Shh, the Mashiach is going to come before I'm going to keep Shabbat. Come on. No, enough. Too much, you Maybe I'm going to give birth as a, you know, a man give, give birth before I'm going to... Keep Shabbat. For them, it's too much already. So for that person that's not willing to change, what I just said is the most difficult thing in the world. Another person that's in the process of doing tshuva, it's in the process of trying to get closer to Hashem, says, I'm willing to change. I don't know what's good, what's bad. I didn't create the world. Only the Creator knows what's good and bad. So I'm willing to change. I'm willing to improve. I want to change. I want to improve. So he says, this is going to help me. I want to try it. So to him... Already it's a, little, it's a lot easier than the other guy because he's already willing to change. So difficulty is based on our predisposition. It's based on our willing to change. So if you're willing to change, there's no limit to how much you can do. Everything will be easy. If you're not willing to change, everything is hard, even the easy stuff. Even they do netilat yadayim once a day. Even do, uh, I don't know, bracha once a day. Say Shema Yisrael once a day. Say, look up in the sky once a day. I don't know, do something. Too hard for the person who doesn't want to change. Say thank you to Hashem. Someone doesn't want to change, saying thank you to a stranger is too hard for them. Why? Because they don't want to change. They think they're perfect or they just think that ah, I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice. Uh, I'm a nice person. I don't steal. I don't do this. I don't do that. So, that's one of the things we need to understand. So he is telling you, is the blessing and the curse again? It comes together. Hashem is giving us opportunity for blessing and opportunity for curse all at the same time. Meaning, you do what He says, get blessed. You don't do, Hashem Elohim. But there's no, no one that slips through the cracks. There's no such thing as I'm going to do sins and I'm still going to end up maybe in like Moshe Rabbeinu's closet. It's not going to work. Everyone gets the same deal. Everyone gets the same potential upside. Everyone gets the same potential downside. Same thing. We all have the same investment. Then it talks about the important part where it says, "Veshafta ad Adonai Eloecha, veshamata bekolo kechol asher anochi mitzavecha ayom ata uvanecha bechol levavecha bechol nafshecha." It says, "This is the tshuva. This is the tshuva. Veshafta, where does tshuva come from? From veshafta. Shafta is from the source of tshuva. Same thing. You returned." And you return, you will return unto Hashem your God. What is return to Hashem your God? And he explains it. By returning to Hashem your God, it means, and listen to His voice, according to everything. Not some things, not maybe, everything. Obviously not all in one shot. If you didn't do anything yesterday, you can't do everything today. But he's saying the goal should be to reach everything. Everything that I command you today, you and your children, 
with all your heart and all your soul. This goes back to the beginning of the shiur when we said doing a, doing a mitzvah. You could do a mitzvah because you're scared. You could do a mitzvah because you're used to it. It's fine. You're going to get a reward for it. But he's saying over here, by doing it with all your heart and all your soul, meaning that by doing it, okay, that's one reward. That's level one. By doing it with all your heart and all your soul, that's level 100. You get a much bigger reward for the same thing. So if you're already going to do it, do it, for, you know, do it 100%. But this, the, the word Veshafta, he's telling you, once you return to me, you're doing, this is Tshuva. This is the concept of Tshuva. Shafta Tshuva. Someone that's looking, someone says, where's tshuva written in the Torah that I could be? Because technically tshuva is not logical. Tshuva is not logical thing. Why? If you go to a judge and say, listen, your honor, you're a judge of uh, flesh and blood, not uh, Hashem You go to a judge and say, listen, judge, I stole $100 million. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Let me go. What's the judge going to do? For chutzpah, he's going to give you another 20 years in prison. What do you mean, let you go, you stole $100 million? Return it first. What, you want to keep the $100 million, you want me to let you go? Even if you return it, you still stole it. Another guy says, the guy after him, after this guy gets thrown in jail for 30 years, the guy after him comes in, says, judge, I heard you're a very, very forgiving judge. On the way, I was arrested for a speeding ticket. I'm sorry about that. But on the way here, I killed five people. I don't know, I have this uh, need to kill people. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. <laughs> What's the judge going to say? No, not only, uh, you know, throw him in jail, throw him in a mental institution. What do you mean you're, gonna, you're not going to do it again? So the concept of tshuva is against logic, meaning that Hashem is telling us, you could sin, you've sinned your whole life up to now. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever. You sinned a long time. 70 years. However long you sinned. But you stop sinning. You feel bad about it. And you promise not to do it again. It's as if everything is great. Starting from You're starting, starting from scratch. Starting from scratch. Of course, certain sins you have to repent for in a different way. But nonetheless, the concept of tshuva is against all human logic. And this shows us the mercy of Hashem. He's giving us a second chance. Flesh and blood judges don't give any second chances. Someone says, nah, I uh, stole $2 billion, but next time I won't do it. There's no, no true buy in this world. Like metal off. Right. So here he's telling you that not only are you, it's okay that you made mistakes now that you're sorry about it, but on top of that, you get a reward for doing the tshuva. Meaning, you actually benefit to some extent from the sins you made. The fact that you're doing tshuva is actually one of the 613 uh, commandments. 613 laws of Judaism. To do tshuva. That's why they say, just say, anyone that has yirat shamayim, anyone that has connection with Hashem has to do tshuva every day. Because no such thing as a perfect person. Even someone that's been born religious. Even the Gdol Adol. Everyone makes some type of sin in their own level, of course. They're not Mechalel Shabbat. But they have different sins. The point is, the concept of Tshuva is actually a benefit. So, you actually benefit to some extent, which is insane. You benefit from the sins you made. Because you did Tshuva. If you, obviously, if you don't do Tshuva, then Hashem Yerachem. But... The point is, doing tshuva is a good benefit. Trying to get rid of the demons. Next verse says, V'shav Adonai Elohecha, Et shevutecha v'rachamecha, V'shav v'kibtzecha, Mikol ha'amim asher efitzecha, Adonai Elohecha shama. After you did tshuva, everyone says, okay, how do I know that your owner is telling me the truth? That, okay, I do tshuva and Hashem likes me again. Next verse. Then Hashem, your God, will bring back your captivity. And have mercy upon you. And he will return and gather you in front of all the people to which Hashem your God has scattered you. If, you, if you're dispersed, will be at the ends of heaven. From there Hashem your God will gather you. Even, even if he sends you into an exile at the end of the world. Even if you're at the worst place in the world. He says, you did tshuva, I'll, I'll take you out of Gehenom even. 
I'll take you out of, do tshuva, I'll take you out of the worst place in the world. And from there he will take you. Hashem your God will bring you to the land that your forefathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will do good to you, and make you more numerous than your forefathers. Even, he's talking about you'll get a bigger benefit than our forefathers that were righteous, that were tzaddikim. He says, this is one of the teachings we get, this is one of the sources, where the Gemara says, a Baal Tshuva can reach a level higher than someone that's been religious from birth. Can reach a higher level. This is one of the sources. He says, I'll make you more numerous than your forefathers, meaning you can reach a higher level. If your Tshuva is real, you can reach a higher level. Hashem, your God, will circumcise your heart. And the heart of your offspring to love Hashem your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. What does it mean circumcise your heart? Last time I heard about circumcision, it's not the heart. <laughs> what circumcise your heart? The orla, the orla of the heart is the yetzara. It's sinning. When you build, when you start, when you live a life of sinning, you become immune to the Yetzirah, meaning that you start thinking, like the Rambam says, people think that whatever is good for them, like the mitzvot, is bad for them. And whenever it's bad for them, like all the sins, is good for them. So you start becoming immune to sins. It becomes normal to you. Your wife walking around half naked is normal to you. Looking at women in the street is normal to you. Gambling on the weekends is normal to you. Gambling every day is normal to you. Driving on Shabbat, smoking cigarettes, you know, and, uh, you know, with your friends as a Jew is normal. Everything is normal to you because you're immune to it. That's the Ola of your, of your heart. Meaning that everything, there's so much Yetzirah, so much sin that you're used to that it's covering whatever good you actually have. Hashem says, when someone opens me up a little bit of an opening, a little bit, the size of the head of a needle, I'll unpeel this orla that they have on their heart, this yetzara, and I'll get them close to me. There's a famous story of a guy who lived in a kibbutz his whole life. I think Rabbi Mizrahi said it, or somebody else, maybe Rabbi Mizrahi, maybe my cousin, I'm not really sure who said it, but maybe Rabbi Mizrahi. Guy who lived in a kibbutz his whole life. Very naive guy, but nice guy. Didn't know what God is, Torah, nothing. Unfortunately, there's parts of Israel that where the, the Jews, the Israelis, don't even know what Torah is. Anyway, one day his friend that left the kibbutz came back to the kibbutz to, you know, he became religious, came back to the kibbutz to try to help a few people. He runs into his friend and he says, uh, Oh, what happened to you? And he says, Oh, I became religious. He goes, What is this religious? He goes, Torah. He goes, What is this Torah? And he starts talking to him about it. And the friend says, if I wasn't the one telling the story and I saw what I saw after it, I wouldn't, tell you, I wouldn't believe the story. He says, why? Wow, what happened? He goes, after maybe, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes of taking, telling this guy about the Torah, he asked me, so show me something. So I opened the book and it happened to be a section that talks about tattoos. Not allowed to have a tattoo. Not allowed to... Get a tattoo in Judaism. Once you have a tattoo, you're not obligated to remove it, unless it causes chilul Hashem. But the act of getting a tattoo is the sin. So he says, once we start talking about tattoos, he says, wait, so this God that created everything and gives me this and gives me this and gives me this, he says I'm not allowed to have a tattoo? The guy says simply, he goes, yeah. He said, you're not allowed to get a tattoo. He says, hold on one second. He goes, Mizrahi, oh, you heard it? Okay. He goes to the back of the house, and the guy, you know, the Baal Tshuva, you know, he's sitting, waiting, waiting, oh, five minutes, ten no minutes. Way. All of a sudden, he starts smelling something burning. Oh, man. Something burning. So he runs to the back, he sees his friend took a hot iron and put it on his tattoo. Wow. His neshama was so high that the minute he heard some Torah, he did 100% Tshuva. He became a giant tzaddik. Uh, he couldn't, the minute he heard what Hashem is, Bichlal, that there's a Torah, he couldn't tolerate doing anything against him. He took everything on in one second. 
That's a level of neshama. This is what it means when someone does tshuva, really wants to do tshuva, really wants to connect to Hashem, Hashem will peel this ola over the heart. This is the concept of tshuva. And this is what it says, Hashem says, Umal Adonai Elohecha, et levavecha ve et levav zarecha, la'ava et Adonai Elohecha. Bechol levavecha ve bechol nafshecha leman chayecha. He says, Hashem your God will circumcise your heart. He's gonna, mal, mal, is lamul, is to circumcise. Mila, brit mila, so mul. So this is the concept of tshuva, and this is what he's telling you. And then, to sum it up, Moshe Rabbeinu ends up with an amazing paragraph, something that we need to understand, something that's a big test, because it's something that goes against everything we learned our whole life. We think, and this is what I heard from this woman today, and she says, you know, being religious is tough. It's, 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 uh, I think she even said nightmare, but I'm not sure. I don't remember. It's very tough. It's very difficult. Yeah, see you, yeah. She says, you know, it's business, this, that, a lot of Lashon HaRa, but a lot of different things, but fine, nonetheless. She wasn't happy with the religion, but she kept a few things. Oh, Hashem, at least that. But the key that stood in my mind, stuck in my mind, is she says, you know, being religious is hard. Keeping mitzvot is hard. Keeping Shabbat is hard. Eating kosher is hard. It's expensive. It's this, it's that. So <laughs> For this commandment, this Torah that we're talking about, he's saying, that I command you today, it's not hidden from you, and it's not distant. He's telling you, this is not something that's so far away from you that uh, you have to go looking for it, try to figure things out. It's not a difficult thing to understand. It's not in heaven for you to say, who could ascend to the heaven for us to take it for us? For that we can listen to it and perform it, meaning that you need someone to connect to Hashem, like Christianity says. No, if you don't believe in Jesus, you can't be, uh, you know, you're in trouble. Yeah. Or sometimes, in, uh, unfortunately, in some sects of our own religion, no, if you don't believe in so-and-so rabbi, you can't connect to Hashem. Also idol worship. So he's telling you right here, it's not too difficult, you don't need anyone, you don't need, you don't need any middlemen. Direct access to the source. Pray to Hashem, Hashem hears your prayers. Whether He answers them or not is based on whether you prayed enough and whether the answer is yes or no. Like we said yesterday in the Shiu, sometimes you pray, you don't get uh, approval. You want a job, you didn't get the job. Sometimes it's either because you didn't pray enough, sometimes it's because the answer is no. Hashem knows the result of it. He knows it's not good for you. And it says, nor is it across the sea for you to say, who can cross to the other side of the sea for us to take it for us so that we can listen to it and perform it? It's not something that you have to travel across the world and reach special, unique type of synagogue and only there you can pray to Hashem. Only there. You don't have to go to Oma, Uman, Uman it's called? You don't have to go to Uman and Rosh Hashanah like a lot of people do. And you don't have to do anything. You can pray in your own house. You can pray in the synagogue. You don't need to go anywhere. Hashem is everywhere. Uman, Uman. Yeah, it's somewhere. I think it's Russia or something like that. Russia. Ukraine. 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 So, what did Ukraine. so this is what he's saying to you. Rather the matter is very near to you. In your mouth and in your heart to perform it. He's saying the Torah and the mitzvot and the connection to God. It's right here. It's in your mouth by praying. It's in your heart. Believing. It's by your actions. What are you doing? People say, no, no. I need the tibalev. I'm uh, religious in my heart. No such thing. It's either you're religious or you're not religious. How do we know you're religious or not? Based on your actions. You keep Shabbat. 
That means you love Hashem. You don't keep Shabbat? To finalize it is he's saying, Re'enatati lefanecha ayom et ha'chayim ve'et ha'tov ve'et ha'mavet ve'et ha'ra. He's saying, see, I have placed before you today the life and the good, the death and the evil. So he says, you have life or death? Life and good, death and evil. Okay, now he's going to explain. Aidoti bachem ayom et ha-shamayim ve-et ha-aretz, ha-chayim ve-ha-mavet. Natati lefanecha abracha ve-ha-klala. U-bacharta bachayim. Leman tichye ata v-zarecha. Le-ava et Adonai Elohecha l-shmoa b-kolo u-l-dvaka bo. Ki u chayecha v-och yamecha. L-shevet al ha-adama asher nishba Adonai l-avotecha. L-avram, l-yitzhak u-yakob l-tet la-em. He says, I call heaven and earth today to bear witness against you. Why? Because heaven and earth are eternal. So he says, you know, each thing in creation has an angel controlling it. These two are eternal. He says, they're always here. They're going to be the witnesses. So you don't come to me and say, I didn't tell you. There was no such thing as Mount Sinai. There was no such thing as uh, Moshe Rabbeinu. There was no such thing as Torah. Oh, there's witnesses. So all the Gilgulim. I have placed life and death before you, blessing and curse, and you shall choose life so that you may live, you and your offspring, to love Hashem your God, to listen to His voice and to cleave to Him. For He is your life and the length of your days to dwell upon the land that Hashem swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. He's saying, first of all, he's saying, I'm going to give you life. And the good, death and the bad. But you see, plenty of people don't keep Torah and Mitzvot. They're living. Mm -hmm. And plenty of people don't follow anything Torah says. They're living. What he's telling you here, life here, the fact that you're operating, the fact that you could see, the fact that you could breathe, the fact that you could think, the only reason, it's not considered life. It considers that you have an opportunity to do tshuva. It's considered that you still have a purpose in this world to fulfill, and Hashem is merciful enough on you to wait. But it's not considered life. Someone that's not following the Torah is considered dead, according to the Torah. It's not considered living. Because a dog is alive. He's not doing any mitzvot. Life in the good, he's saying the life in the good is if you follow what my Torah says. Life in the good means it's eternal. It means the reward is eternal. It means you're going to be eternal. It means it's forever. It's a relationship and connection with God that's eternal. It's not just something temporary. It's something that we're making a deal. We have this covenant. You... Realize that Torah is not far away from you. It's not too difficult to keep. You can do it. Obviously, if you believe in Hashem and you do it, Hashem will help you. Just like if He's helping the people that are doing tshuva, then of course He's helping someone that's already in the middle of tshuva. And for that, you'll have life in the good. Life meaning eternal relationship with Hashem, eternal life. Someone doesn't do it, he says, you're already dead. It's just really a matter of time before I run out of patience and you finish your life and Hashem Yerachem. So the important thing to know is that the Torah is not too hard for us. It's not hard at all. It's all a matter of willpower. It's all a matter of how much do you want it. When Moshe Rabbeinu is telling us that it's not so far away from you, this Torah, it's not something so distant from you, it's not something so outrageous to you, in Masechet Nida, it talks about how a baby has an angel when it's still in the u- uterus that teaches it the Torah throughout the entire pregnancy. But the day that the baby leaves the body, the angel taps on his lip and he forgets the entire Torah. Or she forgets the entire Torah. So the Ma'ah asks, 
if he's going to forget the entire Torah, then why do you bother teaching him at all? This is referring to this verse. He's saying, when you finally come across Torah, even if you were unfortunate, you didn't see Torah your entire life. You lived, I don't know, in Alaska. You lived in a kibbutz. You lived in, I don't know, middle America. You don't know what Jews are. All of a sudden, one day, someone from the kibbutz, your friend came back, said, listen, the Torah is real, Hashem is real, you're not allowed to have tattoos. He says, this is already going to sound familiar to you. Why? Because you heard it 35 years ago, when you were still in your mom's stomach. It's not going to be so distant to you. It's not going to be so far away from you. It's going to just wake up some memories. All of you already know the entire Torah. All of you already committed to do the entire Torah. All of you watching in the video on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, everywhere, already agreed to this. Whether you like it or not, that's just... only thing that matters, whether you like it or not, is how big your reward is going to be. But you still have to do it. It's not a choice of do it or not do it. When you see what Hashem wrote, you know that obviously this is a divine document. This is not something that I wrote. This is not some rabbi wrote. You're already obligated by it. So if you're already doing it, do it with full purpose. So Bezrat Hashem, when we reach the judgment day in the next week, we, play with, we, we already are prepared. We bring some kavanot. We bring some things that we took on ourselves. Anything. That we show up to the trial with something. Extra prayer, extra blessing, extra tzedakah, extra learning, extra anything. Anything you're not doing before this you, add it now. If you are going to do it, please take one of these notes. Write it for me so we can get you a, a special bracha from Yerushalayim, like the other guys got with the video. From Rabbi Fine Kachlon and, and others. But more importantly... You reach the trial with something to show for it. Something. You're saying to Hashem, listen Hashem, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm trying. You have something to show for it. And Be'ezrat Hashem, this will put our scale and tilt it right to the side we want it. To give us shefa, bracha, aslacha, manasa, briyut, yeda batorah, avana batorah, Connection with Hashem and a fulfilling life based on Hashem. If anybody has any questions, we're going to be away for a couple of weeks for the holiday, but I will be doing some shulim in New York, so I'll send you guys online, follow me on YouTube, I'll send you guys some texts with the shulim, we'll do a few synagogues and houses, so we'll still get new shulim, we'll send you via text, and we'll be back here in Florida in a few weeks. And uh, Bezat Hashem will keep getting stronger. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen. 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 Amen.